The Cube presents On the Ground. Here's your host, Jeff Brick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are on the ground in New York City, a really special uh, edition of our On the Ground. We're here at the Lower East Side on the edge of Chinatown, a lot of action, and uh, really excited to come to Fast Forward Labs. We see Hillary Mason all the time at the show, so to actually come out to, to Fast Forward and get a feel for what's going on here on the ground um, in New York. So we're joined by our next guest, Catherine Hume, the Director of Sales and Marketing. Welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Glad so to you, be here. So you're like out on the field. You're, uh, you're dealing with customers, uh, in marketing, big data. So what's kind of the vibe? We, you know, there's a lot of excitement obviously in the tech world about big data, um, and machine learning, but what's happening on the customer side? What do you see? Well, we're seeing all sorts of things. So at Fast Forward Labs, we work with both emerging very small startups that are trying to build products that have machine intelligence or data science oriented capabilities. And then we work with really large Fortune 500 enterprises who have sometimes been in business for hundreds of years and have tons of data that they've collected and are trying to figure out how they can leverage new machine learning products to make use of that and continue to grow in the future. So on the small side, there's a big, um, there's a lot of popularity right now for virtual assistants that happen to combine a lot of the capabilities that we have focused our expertise at Fast Forward Labs on. So um, one of them is language generation, right? So thinking about having a set of data and then representing that data and making it easily understandable by people who aren't data scientists, who aren't an analysts, and can orient um, and understand insights in just plain old human language. So the, we'll, we'll partner with these startups and they say, we've got a great idea to have a, a conversational interface with the product we're developing for consumers, but we're just looking for some, um, you know, some help in building out a feature that uses these capabilities. So we'll step in and our, as technical advisors, we collaborate with their development team and help them realize those capabilities. And from a financial perspective, it's often a trade off. You know, they've gone through Series A, um, it's a little bit of seed funding, sometimes up to Series B, and they, they decide whether or not they want to hire in a new developer or they want to work with us to leverage some of the uh, more emerging ex machine learning expertise to build their products. So they want to build the next Siri or they want to build a different way to communicate than say a Tableau visualization or, or what, what do you mean exactly? What are they trying to So to do? It, there's actually a huge range out there. It's a really exciting time. Uh, one resource to look at, uh, there's an investor at Bloomberg Beta named Siobhan Zillis who has this whole landscape of the machine intelligence world right now. And she has created these little categories that describe things like synthesizers who take lots of data and put it all together in a way that can become actionable. Or um, you know, different advisors say, where we work with one of our startups who's building an assistant for sales and marketing teams uh, who can just go on and look through the calendar and automatically schedule meetings with right. external participants on one's behalf. Right. Um, we have others, uh, we're big users of Slack here as our internal communication chat channel. And there's a company we're advising who's building a bot uh, who you can ask questions to when you're a new, a new employee in a company and say, you know, I'm trying to build out this uh, analytics tool, you know, this, this analysis of my data in Salesforce, not quite sure how to use the reporting capacity. And it's like a, a help tool on steroids that automatically provides you your answer and can even go in and read articles on the internet and suggest tweets for marketers so that they're just automatically generated tweets related to longer documents on the web. And is it and is it pulling data directly out of Salesforce? So that's the other thing that's different, right? The, the API economy is so interesting in that you can pull all these disparate data sources and really apply your own secret sauce, your own kind of new method or mode of an application by using all this stuff that's already out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think from a sort of a, you know, an investment perspective where there's value, it's just adding on an additional la layer of, of value, untapped value to some of the existing either data sets or existing applications that already have analytics on them. One example in the natural language generation space, uh, <laughs> we, uh, in one of our, what well, actually our first report, we talked about systems that can render data more accessible in natural language. Um, there is a recent integration that a company called Narrative Science out of Chicago has made with the data visualization platform Click, where um, you know the sort of the first generation of making data more accessible and democratized to non-analysts and companies was all visualizations, right? So let's let's turn it into pictures and let's render all of this information insights. And then the next stage is, okay, let's go beyond pictures and tell stories, right? right. So there's some people who are visual, some people who are more analytic, and just that, that presentation can be modified to meet different user 
thought patterns and needs. Yeah. So Catherine held up the book for teasing her. So, but but this is interesting. I mean, this is this is part of what the fast forward delivery is, and and these are not yet available on Amazon. But hopefully, you guys are going to. Yeah, we were just talking about that yesterday. Change your business model. You should either sell them, or I guess they're available if you're a client, right? You get them part of the subscription. But but these are pretty interesting and in depth. Um, really reviews of ways to do these things that they cover, you know, on the quarterly basis, whether it's the, the um, what's this from the natural language generation or the picture recognition or the realistic stream. So these are really <laughs> high value books. You gotta talk to fast forward to get one. But, um, so that's good. So now let's shift gears to the big companies. So what's, what's kind of the, the conversation that you have at these big companies that know they need to do something. They probably have different things all over the place. Yeah, so I really, they sort of fall into two categories. So there's the one category that has heard a lot of buzz about machine learning data. Um, there's been a higher up executive who is interested in making a strategic shift to try to use data more effectively. But up to this point, they don't really have a research and development resources internally. Um, analytics, if it does exist, has existed with under the CFO. It's focused on BI, it's focused on analysis of transactional data for PL reporting, et cetera but they haven't really merged out into big data, web analytics, et cetera. So, um, so in those instances, they'll call us and they'll say, we're keen to learn about this. Can you help us transfer your knowledge on what's emerging, what's recently possible? Give us a, you know, give us a, a continuous stream of new ideas so that we can identify an, act an ability to build a new product and shift around our data strategy. Um, the other type of customer we work with do have advanced research and development teams, large financial services companies, um, consumer packaged goods, just you know, some big Fortune 500 companies. And there, we're just an extension of their R&D team. Um, they, um, you know, they, they may have some contact with academics, but it takes a, a long time to read through all of the new papers that are coming out as this landscape changes so quickly. And they know that they can trust us as from an applied perspective to really give them insights that, that could take off and shorten their ability to use a new technique from you know a year's time to two months time. Yeah, it's interesting because you guys are pretty close to the financial, financial district here in Manhattan. And obviously financial services arguably is really a data business, right? They, they, I mean, there's, not even, there's not even money anymore, right? It's just numbers on a page. Uh, when we tr when we trade money and it, and it continues to advance and grow, so those guys and and also uh, you know, little differences, little shaves of portions of points here and there can have a huge impact. One of the things we see though consistently, uh, both in the large banks and then with the hedge funds in the area, is that they're struggling right now to really understand what big data can do for their business. They all have a hunch that they can, they can understand it and should understand it. They are interested in merging analysis, what, what used to be qualitative analysis, so you know, hiring on some recent PhDs or recent undergrads that are going to do research on a company and then use that for their capital market strategy. They really want to incorporate analysis of Twitter, other social media, you know, social media vehicles into their trade strategy, but are still struggling to figure out how that might work. So they bring us in to parse a lot of the rhetoric that they hear from other vendors in the, in the space to, um, to plan out, right, how do we build the infrastructure, what's possible, what that might this lead to in the future, and actually do something that's meaningful as opposed to just data for data's sake. Right, right. Um, and what about kind of the, the, kind of the dark side of, of machine learning that people are afraid of? You know, basically, yeah. Um, taking away everybody's jobs, and you talk about virtual assistants, and you know, it, it seems like there's almost no limit where things can be automated and moved to a machine. Versus uh, the, the flip side of the coin is having more people kind of empowered by a database decision making tools who, who can actually do a better job and continue to have you know, still that contextually sensitive um, point of view that the, the machines don't necessarily have. It's just different. What do you see in the field and, and how is that kind of debate shaping up? There's really two totally different trains of thought on this question. So the one um, that's getting a lot of press uh, because it, it's, it's, it pushes on our fear buttons and is really spectacular is the one where machines suddenly become smarter than we are and take over and exterminate the human race. And we, of course, respect that that's occurring. There's a lot of smart people that think that way, but it's not really uh, where we think our attention should be directed today. Um, in contrast, there's a, a bunch of people that are trying to think about, A, from an employment perspective, you know, to what extent do these systems actually replace uh, middle class, high skilled workers? And our opinion is that it's not gonna happen tomorrow. And we try to encourage our customers to ask more practical questions like, 
for what types of processes internally are we willing to accept systems that give probabilistic results, right? So the, one of the things in using statistical data technologies is that unlike computer programming 15 years ago, these are not deterministic systems. They, they start with the data, they build models, and um, those models will be improved over time. So there's confidence rates in whether or not, right. you know, whether or not the classification, say, is accurate. And they're getting higher and higher, and, and deep learning, as an example, as we did in the image uh, object recognition reports, has some fantastic um, success rates in terms of accuracy. But it's still not, you know, it's not exactly perfect. So, so the question becomes, which business processes can I trust this? Can I trust automating and just let the system do its job? And for, for which other ones can we set up different workflows where system does the first pass, we look at those results, we then you know, refine them and push some information back to the tech team so that they can develop them. And that's a whole different business process than you know, automation of right. a workflow using a step-by-step -step deterministic system. So we think that those questions are actually more important from the employment perspective and just getting the systems to work. Right. Because um, this really is new stuff and there's a lot of work to do. So before we think about you know, the robots taking over, let's actually make robots that work. Right. Well, uh, it's, it's funny you say that because we had um, uh, Dr. Michael Jordan on from Berkeley um, at, a, at a GE event and he talked about you know, the difference between computer science um, and data science, and, and the big one being probability and confidence level. Totally. Where traditional computer science, right, it's A or B, it's on or off, it's one or zero, where in real data science there's always a confidence factor, there's always a probability. But I want to shift gears one more time. Um, you, you mentioned something off here that was interesting. You know, obviously, academic institutions are very involved in the development of, of, of data science, and companies are very involved in the, in the development of data science, but then you mentioned you're out talking to artists. Yeah. Um, which I didn't expect for you to say. So where do artists fit in this puzzle, in this development? Totally, so first just to talk about our company. So um, we, we're unique. We all have um, sort of cross-disciplinary backgrounds. I did a doctorate in comparative literature. Um, we have a couple of people on the team that had done graduate work in physics. So we like weird stuff and we, we try to explore oper you know, things that are on the fringe and use that to influence creative applications and companies. So in doing that work, um, there's a couple of artists based here in New York City, a guy named Kyle McDonald and another named Gene Kogan, who are very actively using new deep learning techniques, the stuff that's used to identify objects and pictures, to, as an example, do what they call style transfers. So you take the Mona Lisa, you take Van Gogh's Starry Night, these famous paintings that you can really recognize as, oh yeah, that was Da Vinci and that was Van Gogh, and then they take a picture, it could be a picture of you, Jeff, and they re-envision your photo as if Van Gogh painted it, or as if it were a Roman, you know, a Roman um, fresco. And um, these are you know, ways in which, because these artists are not like companies that are trying to make money, um, determined by the commercial needs and the market needs that end up shaping how products developed, or not like the academics that are sort of working to find out the theoretical applicability and generalizability of a given technique, they get to go and do applied research without any constraints and end up doing a great job just pushing the boundaries of a technique and also showing its limitations, which for us is immensely valuable when we go to consult with our customers. Right, because you made an interesting comment that once you're in a commercial application or even an academic application that's tied to some other objective, Yep. You start making choices, you start working down a path, even though at the beginning of the path you start at, at point zero, you start having to make decisions and you start picking whether to go left or whether to go right. Yep. And the artists don't have that really kind of limitation, their ability to explore um, and continue to explore and change directions and back up and, you know, is, is very different and, and opens up lots of different, you know, kind of new discovery. Well, it also for these kind of new emerging technologies, we do a lot of work with our large clients on, should I build this technique or should I buy an existing vendor solution? And it's precisely, you know, when anyone in product management knows this, right, there's going to be a trade-off when you're deciding, you can't do everything, have to pick which feature you're going to focus on for your next dev sprint. And that feature should hopefully, if the product marketing and, you know, engineering team are, are tightly aligned, end up serving a larger, as large of a customer base as possible so that you can make revenue numbers. And um, in doing so, often, we saw this with the natural language generation as, as, as we've studied the trajectory of the technology over the last year, um, the, the trend right now is towards what they call self-service tools. Um, so it's a lot of rules that are baked in and it's sort of removing the creativity and data science and making it just more 
rules that, that will link together the way in which someone wants to phrase something in some sort of relationship in a data set. So then for our clients, you know, the questions become, all right, what are you going to use this for? And do you want to have the ability to have the scale and be flexible in the future? In that case, it might be better to go for, to build it internally so you can keep that creativity. It may take a little more time, but you can really customize it. Or do you want to just go for the sort of more plug and play solution? Yeah. So last question, you know, you're out in the field, you're talking to people. What, what's kind of your most common objection that you're running into that people that aren't familiar with Passport question. Labs or really just aren't that familiar with the space or they kind of heard about it? What, what is kind of the most common um, objection and how are, you, how are you answering that? I actually think the most common objection is we have a pretty unique business model. So it is something that, you know, we, we, it's a subscription model. You get access to the research and then you get four hours of on retainer consulting in addition to that. And we'll scope out projects. But um, customers are used to buying, they have different buying patterns and they allocate budget per different departments. So they're used to buying either consulting or research. And when they do consulting, they want to do a scope of work, think about the project, is it time and materials, it's a, you know, how, sort of how things are, are scoped out. And they, we have to do a little bit of education in the beginning of the sales cycle in, in rendering them comfortable with the fact that we're not a consulting shop and we're not a forest or a gardener, we're somewhere in between. Right, right. And um, they just, it takes a little bit of time for them to accept that. And once they do, it's normally okay. And you know, we talk with the lawyers and we say, you know, you can license our content, you can use it internally, but that doesn't mean you can send it externally. Right, and you right. know, we, so it's sort of this, it's, it's the, it's, a, it's the challenge associated with the new business but model. But that's really business mechanics. It's not totally. really an objection yeah. to data science. It's not an objection to, when you said we have a unique business model, I thought you meant that, that the customer across the table was saying we have a unique business model. Of course, you know, none of this stuff can apply to us, which of course, you know, everybody thinks they have a unique business model until you dig under the covers and it's mostly the same as yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. else's, yeah. but maybe a little tweak here yeah, and there. Yeah, I find that, I think that's, I mean, in terms of the actual content, so of course, you know, we're, we're our, our product is, most naturally aligned with early adopters. There's a lot of pragmatists that exist in the large companies that we serve. So there is the, the you know, trying to find the person who really is excited about what's possible as opposed to the person who wants a time-tested, non-disruptive, controlled, comfortable solution that they can easily integrate into their existing processes. They're going to turn into petroleum pretty soon, those people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Catherine. Well, thank you for uh, taking a few minutes with us and, uh, and hosting us here at Fast Forward Labs. Yeah, I'm delighted to have you. Absolutely. So, uh, Jeff Frick here. We're on the ground at Fast Forward Labs in Manhattan, New York City. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.